So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. He is, uh, his job is a planet hunter, which is uh, quite nerdy in itself, if I, uh, if I may say so. But um, uh, he will speak about the languages that might be spoken on the planets that he discovered. So uh, give a big hand to Christian Talman. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christian and I am a nerd. If you tell someone about your hobby and they say, why on earth would you want to do that? Chances are you are a nerd. Now, the art of inventing languages is particularly nerdy among hobbies. And uh, in fact, someone told me, if you put all that effort that you put into inventing languages into learning an actual language, you would be speaking Spanish now. Clearly that person wasn't a nerd. But you guys are, probably, most of you. So I don't have to explain myself that much to you. For example, assume you're on Deep Space Nine, and uh, you've had a bit too much Romulan ale, and suddenly you find yourself face to face with a rather intense looking Klingon. And he says, Nuk dak och bushbok. Now, uh, yeah, now you wish you knew Klingon, huh? Especially if, if you give the wrong answer, you might just shame your house. In the worst case, you, you provoke an international interstellar diplomatic incident. Whereas, in fact, probably just had a bit too many half dead street worms for dinner. So, you see, very important. Now, let's lay down some terms first. A constructed language is, in general, a language that hasn't emerged naturally out there in the real world among a community of speakers, but it has been designed in the mind of some very nerdy creator. Um, there are three main reasons why one might want to do that. First, uh, some people try to do good out in the real world by uniting people. Uh, guy who invented Esperanto is, for example, one of these. He invented Esperanto as a language politically neutral and simple to learn that everybody could speak and then the world would be one. Didn't quite work. Uh, engineered languages are not really intended for people to speak them. They're more like uh, mind experiments in philosophy or, or linguistic research. Lodgebon is one of them. I'm sure nobody knows it. And finally, and uh, that's the part I'd like to focus on, uh, some people invent languages simply because it's fun. Yes, it is fun. And uh, especially uh, languages that are then used uh, in fiction have come to s some degree of, of uh, being known, even outside of nerddom, such as uh, Tolkien's languages or Klingon. Uh, the art of creating a language, just for artistic reasons, is sometimes also called glossopia. So let me speak about Tolkien first. Uh, in his own words, Tolkien considered himself first and foremost a language maker, and not that much of a, a novel writer. He wrote the novels basically just to give his, his languages a world to live in. But later, of course, he mainly became well known for the novels. So Lord of the Rings is definitely the, the most famous one of these. He invented about 20 languages, among them a whole family tree of elven languages. So there's not just one elvish language, as many people think. The two uh, most famous elven languages are Sindarin, the day-to-day -day conversational elvish uh, at the time of the Lord of the Rings. Whereas Quenya is more like the, the ceremonial ancient language that you would use for, for more formal matters. So uh, black speech is just uh, the, what the uh, Sauron forces speak. So let me just uh, talk you through these three examples so you know how they sound. So Sindarin sounds Yamar Prestarain, Hanmaton de Den, Hanmaton de Chai, Hanmaton de Quirith. 
Quenya, on the other hand, sounds like this. Lauria lantar lassis surinen, jeni un notime per rama randarom. Jeni velinte juldara vanier, mior margilis se mi rubore vandune pella. And uh, black speech you might know from the ring inscription. Ashnaz dobatuluk, ashnaz gimbadul, ashnaz kvratatuluk, arbozo mishik. <laughs> so yeah, guess which one of these is the bad guy. <laughs> now, uh, there are some other comments outside of Tolkien that, that have gained a measure of notoriety. Klingon, I mentioned already, sounds a bit like this. It means that, but listen to me, he's a liar. And uh, yeah, that's the clip up. Now the blue-skinned aliens from, from Avatar did not be, have their own language. Sounds like this. Oyen at the Gamayas gown. But sounds silly. You see the movie? The Dothraki from Game of Thrones have very recently also acquired a language. And in fact, the language creation society, which is made up from the mailing list of conlangers on the internet, uh, was commissioned by HBO to create a language for them. And uh, David J. Peterson got uh, the commission and invented a very nice language for the, for the series, which is now heard on TV screens everywhere. Sounds like this. <laughs> it's a very common saying in the market. <laughs> and finally, uh, Laadan is less well known. It's a language invented by a feminist writer called Suzette Hayden Elgin. Because uh, she found that English and other real life languages are often dominated by the by the patriarchic culture that brought 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 them forth. And so there's a lot of things you can't really say in English. You need a lot of words to say them. So uh, in her language, these things are very simple. They just have a word for it. So for example, Rami Mesh is to refrain from asking out of evil intent. You can easily see how that would be useful. Yeah, that's good job, Now I'm sure uh, you guys all are itching to make your own language after what you've heard. Well, it's not that hard. Uh, here's what you need for it. First of all, phonology. You need to think about what your language should sound like. Then vocabulary, what you just need to make up a lot of words. Grammar, you need to think about how these words are put together to make sentences. You might not like grammar, but you do need it. If you, if you just make up words, you use them like they're in your native language, then you're basically speaking your native language with very funky words. <laughs> you need culture as well, because uh, culture is very present in the, the makeup of a language. Uh, as I've mentioned, Tolkien needed his, his fictional world in order to to give his languages a backdrop to, to live in. And optionally, uh, history. Tolkien didn't just invent languages that float in midair, but he also thought about the proto-language from which these languages descended. So he uh, actually made up a bit of that language first and then used realistic linguistic processes to derive the, the newer languages from them. That's advanced stuff. Then uh, you do need some basic knowledge of linguistics, what the parameter space is. If you just know one language, then probably you take everything for granted and you don't know what, what else is out there. But don't worry too much, you don't need a degree or anything. Uh, there's very good websites that give you a nice overview of what can be done in other languages. It's called the Language Construction Kit, for example. Just Google it. You need inspiration because, frankly, there's not much uh, you can do in the real life with your invented languages, so you have, you have to have fun doing it. And finally, time. Conlang is never finished. You can always improve it and make new words and that kind of stuff. Also, uh, you can go pretty wild in that parameter space here. Even if you think you've just had an extremely crazy idea, you will usually find out, just discussing with other conlangers, that it already exists in a, in a natural language, and they do it even worse than you, 
It's called the attitude principle. And that line already does it except worse. Now, phonology. Phonology is basically the, the business card of your language. If somebody asks you what your language sounds like, you have to say if the word or sentence of it, and they will judge it mainly by the sound of it. So, do you want it to be pretty or ugly? Uh, there's actually merit in making an ugly language. I would say Klingon's pretty ugly, but it's kind of ugly in a good way. You know? There's a lot of other things you can, you can consider. If you want it to sound like that or like that, for example. But uh, there's a few things you should, uh, you should keep in mind. One of them is, can you actually pronounce the sounds that you want the language to have? You don't have to, you know. You can invent a language that nobody can pronounce. It's just less satisfying. Um, also, one thing to consider, if people want to make their language special in some way, um, they like to add, to, to take the, lang the, the sounds that they're familiar with and then add in a few funky new ones. But you don't have to, you can also just take your inventory of sounds you know and kick out half of them. For example, uh, Polynesian language, Rotokost has only 12 sounds in total. And the language home, on the other hand, I believe that's what it's pronounced, has uh, 112 of them. And a lot of them are clicks like... English is kind of in the middle with 42. Now let's have a closer look at the vowels. I'll be spending a bit more time on phonology than on the rest because it's kind of like the topic. These are the, the vowels in Dutch. You can see there's quite a lot of them. And I haven't just thrown them on, on the field like that, that, like a bunch of dice. Actually, their position here in this trapeze is, uh, it actually shows you the position in the mouth where they are produced. So these are the front vowels, these are the back vowels. And uh, these are high vowels that are made up on the roof of your mouth, and, and these are the lowest one. There's also another additional dimension here, uh, that's roundedness, whether or not you round your lips when you pronounce them. So for example, E and U are the same sound, except that one is rounded and the other is not. Uh, there's a lot of empty space here that can be filled, for example, if you can round e into u, you can also take u and unround it. But first I have to show you. There's also some diphthongs. I, l, and au in Dutch. Now, if you unround u, you get u, which is the vowel in its own right. And in between u and e, there's space for u, for example, which is very common in, in Russian. Spanish has a very simple uh, vowel system. In fact, there's a language that only distinguishes a high and a low vowel and no other qualities. Now, uh, there's other things you can do with, with vowels. For example, the normal voice that you use when you speak is modal voice, ma. There's also nasal voice, ma. Breathing voice, ma. <laughs> and creaky voice, ma. And I think actually, they actually do appear in natural languages, believe it or not. And there's also tone, so uh, the melody with which you speak a vowel. So the five words, ma, 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 and ma, actually mean uh, five different things in, in Mandarin. I hope that was correct. I don't actually speak Mandarin. And also, finally, you don't really need vowels if you, if you don't want to. But the Czech language has this nice sentence, which doesn't need any vowels, as you can see. Now, consonants also have a coordinate system like the vowels do, but it's a bit different. Here on the horizontal axis, I have place of articulation, where in the mouth you make the consonant. It begins here at the lips, in the front of your mouth, and it goes back through your mouth and down the throat. And here in the vertical axis, you have the manner of articulation. At one given point in your mouth, you can make a, a wide range of different sounds. So for example, these are the, the labial sounds made with your lips. They're pa, ba, fa, 
the, the, what, and qua. These are just the English inventory. Not all dialects of English actually use hoof anymore. Now, if you pick a horizontal line instead, these are the voiceless fricatives. Uh, if you go along this line, you, you move through your mouth, but you make the same kind of consonant each time. So, fa, fa, sa, sha, and ha. Voiceless fricatives. Now, uh, there's a lot of empty space here as well between all these consonants, and in fact, in every empty space here, you can actually pronounce another sound that English doesn't use. So if we go through here, for example, and just fill in the blanks, we get fa, fa, sa, sha, xia, ha, 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 and of course, ha. You have to choke a bit on it. Um, so many places of articulation. But there are also other manners of articulation that English doesn't use. So for example, the T is aspirated in English and the D isn't. But it's not a, necessarily the case in other languages. So you can pronounce it plainly, ta, as in French. You can also aspirate the voiced stop, so that gives you da. You can pre-aspirate the concept that gives you da. It appears in Icelandic, for example. You can pharyngealize a, a stop that gives it that choky sound again. Da. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly. You can spit the consonant. Da. Or you can suck it in. Da. So that's a very nice one. And finally, the clicks are the ones that you don't really you, you don't use your lungs for those. You only make them in your mouth. So the alveolar click is, which appears in the name of the language, horn, as you've seen before. And you can combine these in, in all kinds of ways. So if you, if you take uh, the uvular place of articulation, the uvula is the little knob on the back of your mouth. That's what you use to make in Dutch. You can also make a stop out of that, which gives you Arabic uses that sound, for example. And you can even do strange things like implosis, which gives you Then uh, the R is also a special case. There's a lot of different sounds that people identify with the, the R principle, although they're quite different sounds, really. So the English R is, for example, very characteristic. If you use that in your conlang, you're kind of going to sound very English, whether you like it or not. There's R as well. There's R, there's R, and D, and whatever. There's a lot of choice there. Now, vocabulary. The baseline assumption is that if you're going to create a language, you have to make up your words. If you do that one by one, by hand, you want them to sound just right, that's a lot of work. Uh, you can also use a random generator. There are some that actually, you can put in your, you can put in your syllable structure and just pound out thousands of words for you to choose. But that's pretty impersonal, especially if you put in a word list and you let it generate. Names you might end up with a like lua for mountains and cork for water, which sounds kind of the wrong way around, doesn't it? So what well, I think you can do is just you know generate random words and then pick the ones that sound best for whatever you want to choose. Uh, derivation is also a really powerful tool. So uh, in Dothraki, for example, oi, the word for for blood, appears in a lot of other words. So there's kriya, which means to bleed, or askoyi, which means promise, but actually literally that means a uh, word of blood. Because if you don't keep it, there will be blood. Um, another thing you can do is, uh, instead of an, an a priori language, you can make an a posteriori language, which means you start with an existing language, and you just generate a, a daughter language for that language. Um, one extremely popular choice is Latin, because in Europe there's already a large number of different sounding languages that all derive from Latin originally, so it's kind of easy to see how that works. There's, it's well documented as well, so you can easily make up a fictional country somewhere in Europe where they speak a different kind of Latin. 
Here's a sample from one of my call lines, Jovian, which is based on Latin. I played based it on classical Latin rather than on vulgar Latin because I didn't have a vulgar Latin dictionary at home. Um, so I needed a word for little truck. And there's not really anything like that in classical Latin. But there's a word for load, um, from which you can derive the adjective honorarius, meaning load-bearing. And if you pipe that through all the various sound changes that produce Jovian out of Latin, you get Andreier. Sounds quite different. Uh, you lose some of the unstressed vowels. Uh, that vowel actually leaves some umlaut diphthongization in the stressed vowel before it. You get an epithetic D here, an epithetic schwa over there. But it's not trivial, but even though it's derived from an existing language. Now, grammar. Yeah, a lot of people don't like grammar, but I kind of do. It's very nerdy. Um, I'm just going to be very general here. Uh, there's three principles of grammar. Grammar is basically about how you put together words so they make sense. So you usually have to mark the words to, to tell the, the, the listener what they're supposed to mean in the context. One way to do it is uh, isolating languages, such as Mandarin, where the words are so compact that you can't really afford to change them in any way. They would immediately mean something else entirely. So if you want to change a sentence like, uh, I eat food, to I have eaten food, for example, then all you can do is, is uh, put in an extra word to show that. Um, agglutinative languages are quite different. There you have a, a bag of puzzle pieces that you can stick to your words to, to make them mean something. So this whole string here is inuktitut, which is the Eskimo language, but one is not supposed to say that word. Um, and that means I can't hear word very well. And every piece of that big string here is still recognizable. For example, nit means not. Uh, you can get very long words like this, so I, I don't like it too much. Uh, a lot of conlangers use uh, agglutinative languages because they're kind of easy. You make up a puzzle piece and then you can use it everywhere. But uh, I don't know, it's just a bit inelegant, I think. Now, inflecting languages, on the other hand, they change the word as well, but they don't do so in a transparent manner. For example, the Spanish word comí means I ate. So it's a verb in the uh, first person singular and the simple past tense. And all that information is actually in the E. And you can't take that apart and point to the part that means first person singular and the other part that means past simple as you would in, in a word like these. So that's, uh, you have to make up a lot of forms in order to cover the whole parameter space, but at least the resulting words are nicely compact and elegant. And uh, the English go, went, gone, for example, is also an example where you, you clearly can't see anymore how these words ever came to be, but that's just what they look like now. Um, Here's a fun thing from, from a, another language of mine, Urumba. It's a bit of a more uh, experimental language, and it was mainly made to, to have fun with syntax. So I'm going to uh, use English words to demonstrate that because it's, it's kind of hard to, to follow otherwise. Urumba has only two verb forms, so that's very simple there. Uh, for example, man sing would mean the man sings. The verb actually tells you new information here, whereas man singing would mean the singing man, so the singing is not new, you use it to identify the man instead. Now, another thing you have to remember here is that the word order is always subject, verb, object, so man throws stone means the man throws the stone, not the stone throws the man. Now, with this construction, uh, I will you can basically say anything in the language, and you don't need any cases and no prepositions, like all other languages do, which is kind of weird, isn't it? But there's a way to do that using serial verbs. How does that work? Well, let's say 
you want to say the man throws a stone at a bird, killing it. And there's an extra rule that tells you that an object that was previously used by a verb becomes the new subject of the next verb in a, in a series. So, man throw stone, go to bird, die, means man throw, oh, yeah, so that's the word order up there. So that down there means man throw stone, stone, go to bird, bird, die. Get it? So, basically, in the English sentence, you have at, which is a preposition, which tells you that the bird is the target of the, of the verb action. In Urumba, you just use the word, the verb go to in an, in a, an idiomatic way to, to express that meaning. Now, that promotion of an object, an object to a subject is not always wanted. If you want to say the man who paints the wall has a dog, it's not correct to say man painting wall have dog, because it means the man is painting the wall, but then the wall has a dog. That's not what you mean. Instead, uh, if you put a, a phrase break here, so man painting wall, have dog, then clearly, the man is painting the wall, and that whole phrase, so the man painting the wall, has a dog. You can break that, that promotion cycle by putting in a comma and pr pronouncing it in a, in a different way, uh, the whole phrase. So. Or another thing you can do is you can use a passive verb, being painted by, instead of painting, and you can say, Wall being painted by a man had dog. So, walls painting by, being painted by the man, and the man has a dog. And it works. So, uh, you can do these kind of things, but as you can see here, things get complicated very quickly. If you have to say a very complicated uh, sentence in this language, you might run into trouble. But that's why you need time to do conlanging. And um, of course, just to show you, uh, the actual words in Urumba don't sound like English. So the, uh, the sentence, man throws stone, go to bird die, would be Toruba kariye tiruba binya. The spelling makes sense, I promise. It's just not so trivial. Uh, culture. Um, as you've seen in Tolkien, uh, Culture is very important for, for making a language because the language has hard-coded uh, expressions that kind of give it a certain flavor and it has to match the culture of the uh, people who speak it. So for example, this, these are different ways to say hello in languages. If you just meet a random elf in the woods, probably he's going to greet you with Magovanen, which means well met, which is quite neutral. Now if you were to meet a queen among the elves, might want to be a bit more elaborate and polite. You're going to switch to the to the high elven language and say something like la lumine which means a star shines on the hour of our meeting. Very elaborate. Now the Dothraki, they really have a bad sense of humor. You don't want to think you don't want to make them think that you're laughing at them or anything. You have to treat them with a lot of respect. And then maybe they won't kill you, and instead say, as jamar jamar kahan, which means respect to the respectful ones. That's the Dothraki. And Klingon, they don't really have a word for hello. They, they don't believe in niceties like that. They just say, Muknech, what do you want? <laughs> um, there's a saying, uh, like a, an urban myth that that the Eskimo language has hundreds of words for snow. It's not quite true. There, there's basically four words for snow that they, they distinguish between falling snow, lying snow, drifting snow, and a snow drift. They have different words for that. And of course, since the language is probably agglutinative, you can stick a lot of puzzle pieces to these words to make longer words in the end. Now, uh, Sami, on the other hand, which is a language from, uh, from Scandinavia, does have really a lot of words that they use to describe snow. This is just a selection of them picked off a website. You're not supposed to read them all. I, I really like these one, for example, Spoavdi, empty space between snow and the ground. <laughs> or uh, Sievelula, 
the state of things when the spring snow is so soft that one sinks in it. <laughs> How can we not have a word for that? <laughs> so yeah, think about these things. Finally, if you have a call line, and um, you might feel a bit alone with it because you can't really talk to your friends and your family about it. Um, there's other people like you. I have a, a mailing list called Callang L. Uh, there's, it's an active forum. They're friendly. You can talk to them about your language. They talk about their language. You can learn from them. They learn from you. It's nice. Um, uh, a common thing to do is a translation exercise on that list. So uh, somebody might say, today I've been thinking how I should use entire sentences as noun phrases in other sentences. For example, I like the fact that a dog bit you. In English we use this the fact that uh, construction to make it work. But of course that might work entirely differently in other languages. So that guy might show you the translation of that sentence into his language and other people will do it with their languages and then you can see how how it works for each language, uh, for each language differently. So Obrene is one of my own languages and uh, in that it would be Nanjujilaposkwarva. And uh, so you, you point, you uh, post that on the forum, you give the language itself, the, the phrase, uh, phonetic transcription, everybody knows the international phonetic alphabet on the call language, it's extremely useful. Then uh, you give a line that, that shows the grammatical constructions in each of the words, so people can reconstruct what you did there, and you give a literal, a literal translation of the phrase as well. So, uh, I'm sure you all want to make your own language now. Well, it's not so difficult. Uh, do look at the language construction kit. Do ask me if you have any questions. And uh, if you do invent a language, I wish you good luck or success, as the Klingons would say. Blah. <laughs>
to the next person with a short vocabulary and grammar guide so he can translate it from the other language into his own languages. And then that goes on, and in the end you have a completely different story, but it's fun. <laughs> I was wondering um, if uh, language makers uh, uh, are gathering and ta actually talking in their language because I can imagine that you feel quite lonely. Um, and um, <laughs> you put all the time and effort in a language and then it's something like a dead language. Well, being nerds, we're kind of we're comfortable with the internet as a medium of communication. <laughs> so that the the conlang mailing list is actually pretty effective at that. But there are some extroverted uh, line makers that organize conferences for for uh, for con language, which which actually happen at universities that have linguistics courses and that kind of stuff. So those are pretty well attended, as far as I know. I haven't actually been to one, but it's definitely on my list. Question: um, Do you think that the can linguists tell the difference between constructed language and a real language and a natural language? Um, what, are the, what are the sort of things that give an, a constructed language away typically? That's a, a good question. And in fact, there are some languages, uh, a subgroup of artistic languages that we call lost langs, that pretend to be real life languages that were lost in history. And since Europe was basically covered in other languages before the, the Proto-Indo-European language people came and uh, conquered everything. There's a lot of space in Europe for languages to have existed, but which no longer exist. So if you make up your language to look like an actual language that was lost, and you do a good job at it, you might be cited by some linguists who think that it was an actual language. It has happened. But uh, yeah, you have to do a good job at it. Uh, for one last question, here at the front. Uh, did anyone really make a new script rather than using letter letters? Very good question. Um, on my title slide, you can see some made up script. Um, there you go. Um, this is a script that Tolkien made up for his Elven languages. It's not actually translated into a, an Elven language. This is just English words uh, written with his letters. But a lot of other people do that for their languages as well, especially if they're uh, putting a lot of effort on making the culture behind the language, then clearly the culture needs its own script, especially if, it's, if it doesn't happen on Earth. This is Nerd Nights in Quenya. This says uh, Nerd Night Amsterdam, cool. the art of. It, it's, it's not in Quenya, it's in English. Oh, okay. It's just that uh, the letters are called Tengwar. <laughs> well, thanks. Christian, thank you so much. Let's give him a big hand.